Just to start things off, a couple of weeks ago, I had a very, very interesting meeting with the CEO of a company called Stellar Amenities. And Stellar Amenities hold the contract with SpaceX to build the first communities on Mars once that migration starts in full force. And when I was speaking to the CEO, she said to me, Paul, one of the things you have to realize with development, extraterrestrial development, is that it takes sustainability to a completely different level. And apparently, there are already many, many sets of regulations in place that were decided a decade ago as to the sustainability quotients that will be necessary when we start inhabiting extraterrestrial worlds. One of the fascinating aspects of that sustainability is that the structural materials used will be nano-organic derivatives. In other words, people will use CRISPR DNA genetic technology to re-engineer living matter to be used as building materials. Most of that living matter will be extruded from the DNA of particularly strong vine-type plants and things of that kind, but also will be extruded from certain types of uh, porous fungus and things of that kind. Now, this made me start thinking, why is it that in terms of building here on planet Earth, we still appear to be a very long way behind that agenda? So, for instance, it is actually the case that the big aviation manufacturers, the Airbuses, the Boeings, they will be using nano-organics instead of aluminum by 2040. Now, that's still a very long time away. And even their processes are not as sustainably focused as the ones that the likes of stellar amenities will be using. So, in order to kick things off and make life even harder for the forthcoming panel, I'd like to pose a couple of questions. Is net zero being strong enough? Is that being ambitious enough? Shouldn't we actually be aiming now for net positive? And shouldn't we actually be quite rigorous in implementing these standards? Shouldn't we start making standards compulsory rather than voluntary to subscribe to? These are all things to start considering. So let's get panel three of the day now in motion. And let me call these stellar personalities up one at a time, as we did earlier on. So um, this morning, I was blow drying my hair, which is a bit of an anomaly in my house at the week due to time constraints. And my son came up to me and asked me, where am I going today? And I said, I'm going to interrogate superheroes. <laughs> And before he asked me what their superhero, superpower was, I was able to tell them that hopefully the people that we're talking to today will be able to enlighten and help us to save the planet. Um, so a little few facts on the net zero buildings of the future. So 38% of energy consumed is consumed by buildings. 36% um, is energy related to carbon emissions. 50% of our resources consumption come from buildings, and 80% of buildings that exist today will exist in 2050. And that number is going to double, so, and that number of buildings that exist today, excuse me, is going to double. Now, considering we're building 50 million square meters of retail, real estate every single day on this planet, and that, um, where that trajectory means we have a double-edged sword that, that we really need to address. One is our existing buildings, and the second is our future buildings. So thanks to all our panel members for coming today. It's good to um, get to interrogate people, superheroes like yourself today, and get some insights from you. So let's start with um, Dr. Ali. Oh, sorry, I'm going to start with um, um, Mikhail. I know it right. Um, I guess today we've talked a lot about net zero and what everyone's aspirations are and why are we not doing it and why is it not legislation? How do you in Atkins sell the net zero drive? Is it something that um, is done over governance? Is it seen as an investment? How are you really pitching that to your clients and to people here today? 
Thank you, Luis. Yeah, so our clients in the Middle East region are you know, increasingly focusing more on net zero carbon uh, in terms of building performance. And we at Atkins, we are helping our clients throughout their you know, journey towards net zero target that they want to achieve from the very beginning of the project life cycle until the very end, which include uh, planning, design, oper construction operations, and also uh, asset reuse uh, optimization. So we actually have developed at Atkins to address this issue at the, um, that the existing buildings actually um, will exist um, by 2050. The 80% of the building that is built already now is going to still exist in 2050. So we actually need solution for these existing buildings to be decarbonized. So um, we have actually developed this uh, um, digital tool um, that would allow our clients to see their assets um, with the carbon um, performance visualized, visualized um, uh, across the uh, portfolio of buildings. So um, basically, this uh, solution will enable our clients to uh, start from the benchmarking um, of their building assets um, across the, their entire portfolio, so it's multiple buildings, so it's not just you know, one building that they own, but it's the, um, you know, across their portfolio of buildings, they can see where is the um, actual potential for these buildings to be decarbonized, and um, they can find the quick you know, wins uh, across their, this portfolio. And that would allow them to now strategize you know, how to go about uh, their road to net zero. So the, you know, from benchmarking to the road mapping. And then we also help them deliver these solutions. So this kind of strategic thinking um, will enable our clients to, to actually tackle this decarbonization of existing buildings um, at the portfolio level. And we, th we think that is a uh, you know, really much needed solution in this region. But is their driver, um, they want to decarbonize, they want to save money, is it compliance with their global groups? Is it marketing, is it a marketing tool? Is it increase in valuation of their buildings? How, what's the real kind of driver for them, if you could name one that you find the most significant when you're pitching? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we definitely believe that you know, there is, this is a, a ad, you know, added value to our clients. Um, you know, from the, the point of view that they can actually, you know, achieve the net, net zero goal that these organizations set by themselves. But also, um, it it's actually allows them to uh, see the cost-effective solutions. And that's the, you know, real kind of benefit that the client, you know, want to materialize on. And so, this is a, a digital, you know, benchmarking system um, that helps our clients um, to, to find uh, the most cost-effective solutions, in interventions, uh, you know, whether it's a HVAC uh, solution improvements or lighting or uh, uh, building management systems uh, improvements, uh, facade improvements, all of these interventions will contribute towards um, helping them to get to net zero in a more cost-effective way. Thank you. Um, Dr. Jaga, it's great to have a developer here today to understand what your requirements are. I guess you'll have a lot of people knocking on your door asking you, can we help you with your sustainability mission? And you've obviously got a lot of competition from other developers in the region that have jumped on board the net zero train. What, um, what are SOBA doing and what are your long-term ambitions? Good afternoon, and uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Um, to your question on what are the drivers uh, or uh, what exactly we are make, uh, doing in the field of sustainability, the main driving force, of course, is on the vision of the management, where it wants to um, uh, enhance the bottom line using credible, through credible initiatives. So that's what it could be low-hanging fruits to the extent of uh, energy savings, water savings, it could be uh, driving circularity through uh, um, resources optimization, replacement of uh, tissues with uh, towel rolls. It could be uh, replacing uh, cups with uh, ceramic, uh, 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 ceramic mugs. Various other initiatives at the low-hanging fruit level. 
And uh, it also depends on how uh, the corporates or how the developer wants to position uh, itself in the long-term strategic one. So that takes you back to uh, climate reporting, it can, it, to the ESG reporting and things like that, where the developer not only uh, records uh, its uh, achievements, but also articulates its uh, climate strategy in the long run in order to align itself with uh, the government's directive. But when it, uh, the most important thing is the developer, the type of developer makes a lot of uh, difference. As Shoba, it, uh, it is a, it's a unique backward integrated uh, organization where it has its development arm, design arm, construction arm, facilities management arm, communities management arm, it has got its uh, own facade uh, factory, it has got its own uh, furniture industry. So it, all these verticals work in perfect harmony, helping Shoba to uh, consistently deliver uh, high quality sustainable assets on time. So it is having a great control uh, and not only control but uh, responsibility and accountability as well. So if our in-house design team um, designs a facility with a particular energy intensity, so it's the same developer who demands that at construction and operation as well. And if there is, uh, some, if there is a gap somewhere, the same team uh, comes in. So it's not like we finish our job and then uh, leave the rest to a contractor or leave the rest to the facility manager. Everything comes under single arm. That unique backward integrated model uh, uh, helps a lot. And, and when it comes to sustainability, again, there are different ways you can go. I, I can say my building is certified platinum. It's uh, sustainable. But there's a lot of difference between a certified building and a performing building. Agree, so, 100%. So, so you would have seen <laughs> hundreds and thousands of uh, uh, publications across the world, not everywhere, where there's a significant gap between a certified building and a performing building. And the gaps are mainly due to several reasons, not only the design or the construction, but then the operations. So uh, unless uh, sustainability as a philosophy is driven from the top management all the way to the operations, it's quite difficult to have a building that truly uh, performs or stands testimony to its original credentials. So uh, Shoba does that. Uh, at the operation level, and it also uh, embeds sustainability at the design level by virtue of having uh, its own in-house design team and the flexibility to have multiple alternatives all on the same umbrella. And uh, the same because of its in-house construction, the design team also gets in to make sure that it is in line with the original design, and then the entire thing is transferred to the FM team. So that's the way we try to uh, achieve operational sustainability at the basic level. And beyond that, we are doing a bit of a climb. We have started getting onto emissions inventory of our assets and ESG reporting and climate uh, finance, sorry, uh, climate uh, risk analysis and other things that are going to be of non-financial disclosures. I sometimes when I go to sustainability conferences, there's a lot about climate change. And it's all well and good standing on a stage in front of people saying climate change, climate change. We really have to make it relative. And you're a developer who needs to make a profit. And we're potential buyers that want to get value for money and have a certain budget to buy our house. So I guess it's trying to find that sweet point between doing what's right and getting um, doing what's right for the planet and, and getting the right price point as well. Probably until legislation comes into play, which probably leads me on to Carrie, who's here, um, probably in a legal representative <laughs> form. Um, where do you think frameworks and legislation can really play a part in what we're doing? There's obviously a huge amount of buildings in the UAE and trying to transition them all at once would just, it would never happen, the amount of um, money that would need to be invested, so I'm assuming it would need to happen over time. Would you, what would you regard as a good framework to start this journey? So I think we have to understand that there is legislation in place right now. So we, it, if we go back decades ago, since the 90s, the UAE has had some legislation in, 
in place to protect the environment. So back in 1999, we had the federal law on the environment protection, and that actually penalized and set standards to how to protect the environment. But since then, we've moved on, and we've moved on in spades, uh, and we need to actually update these. And there has been a journey of updating the legislation. So we move on, uh, you know, from 2001 to 2007, there were numerous um, circulars and agreements that were put in place on a, on a, on a provincial, sorry, on a emirate level to show, uh, to try to control the impact of the construction industry on the environment. But that really became cemented in 2010 when we had uh, building codes that became mandatory in two of the Emirates. And I'm sure the developers all know about this. So in, in 2010, we had the Istadama Pearl rating system that was introduced in Abu Dhabi. And then uh, in Dubai, we had the Dubai Green Building regulations that were introduced. And initially, these were meant to be just to um, ensure that government buildings met the standards that are required to protect the environment in their buildings. But then, um, shortly thereafter, they became mandatory to all buildings. And it's obviously easy to put them for new buildings. When you have a new structure, it's really easy to apply these standards. But then later on, you, you, you come into the effect, um, like Mako mentioned, that what about existing buildings and how do you update them? So although the regulations do apply to some existing buildings, I think we still have a way to go to try to make sure that there is a legal framework that sees us through the transition to that net zero journey. Um, and there are, there are really numerous, numerous efforts and initiatives that have been produced. Uh, I'm just going to highlight a few of the really important ones. You know, we've mentioned the... Um, the Dubai building regulations, which have been updated again in 2016, in 2020, and 2023. They're now under the name of Al Safat Green Building Regulations. Um, we have the Istadama, and most recently in Raq, we have the Barjil Building Code, which is a fantastic initiative that was made by uh, Ras Al Khaima. It started in 2019 as a voluntary basis uh, program, so they wanted developers to really sign up to it and apply it to their new buildings. But as of 2020, it became mandatory. So we've got uh, you know, three emirates that have already published building codes with standards to try to meet the net zero initiative. Um, and just most recent, like this year, in 2023, uh, the UAE signed um, the Net Zero Charter, where all seven emirates and the federal government have agreed to try to, not try, but have agreed to put in, in place policies, plans, um, measures to try to achieve the Net Zero uh, goal that we have. Now, is that enough? And this is where, where we are. I think from a, from a legal perspective and as a lawyer, one of the main things we look at is how to enforce. First of all, what is the standard? You know, you mentioned, which is really lovely, that you guys are trying um, and implement in ways to have um, buildings that comply with the climate change initiatives that we have. But to what standards are you measuring these? What are you using? to apply your designs? You know, what standards are you applying? So there's a, a question from a legal perspective is, if you're gonna monitor or measure something, what are the, what are the standards that you're measuring against? Because unfortunately, in the Paris Agreement, which obviously the UAE signed and was one of the first, it was the first GCC country to sign up to, the definition of net zero is very opaque. It's not well defined. So you don't have a definition, a standard that you can follow. So that leaves the question from a legal perspective. I'm gonna, if I'm gonna try to enforce something, one, I need to define the standards. Two, I need to put in place a mechanism to measure it and a mechanism to monitor it and monitor how it's gonna come along. And three, and this is a really big question, do I use the carrot or the stick? I am, am I going to incentivize the developers when they follow these standards voluntarily? Or am I going to penalize them when they fail to achieve the targets that I've set? So there's, there's that whole journey that has to be, I think, Im thought about and implemented and designed. And I think from, there's a lot of optimism, especially with the ch charter that the um, seven emirates signed up with the federal government. 
that this is going to come into play very, very soon. Thank you. And you've mentioned a lot of legislations, I think most of us are aware of them, and Dr. Um, Jagga just touched on the fact LEED certification or certification in general doesn't necessarily, as do regulations, give us the output that we're after, which is reducing our greenhouse gases. Um, and energy as one, and we talked, Majid mentioned earlier, we have to reduce our energy by 30% on existing bills by 2030. Um, Hassan, you're probably an expert in this. What are you seeing with regards to benchmarks in the region and, and how do they vary across different sectors? And how can we incentivize people to reduce those benchmarks or to sign up to them, I guess? Well, first of all, we need to get data. Data is still not uh, very available. Um, we've done a lot of studies for governmental entities, so as Griffin, we have a lot of data, but a lot of that is not published. Currently, we're working with Ras Al Khaimah on their energy label um, system, which basically will set something similar to Dubai. So Dubai already have an energy label for existing buildings. It's still in its infancy, let's say, but there was a lot of data that has been collected for hotels, offices, and residential. Um, the problem with existing buildings is that it's still commercially driven. So people are still looking for ROI of five years in Dubai. In Abu Dhabi, because of the tariff, maybe it goes up to seven. So currently working with ADNOC on 500 buildings, um, we're trying to push the, the uh, ROI to a higher number of years. But if you look at Dubai, for example, normally no one goes beyond five years because it's still a very commercial uh, decision. If you want to hit net zero, so definitely these deep retrofits need to take place. Currently, we're just looking at maybe adding VFDs, um, changing one of the chillers on, on a maybe a 10 chiller building. So there has to be a, I would say, legislation need, need, to, need to happen. So, for example, now in New York, because of these stringent requirements, some buildings are adding CO2 capture um, equipment on their boilers to take out the CO2 before that flue gas leaves the building, although in the city it's still not taken as a, let's say, acceptable way to reduce it. But once you have, you know, regulations in place and using the stick, people will need to act. So they're acting, although even it might be the right decision, but at least they came up with, 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 uh, with a decision and put these equipment and they're trying to remove the CO2 before it goes out. Um, so in terms of benchmark, obviously the you know, we have a lot of residential buildings, um, uh, and that EUI is normally between maybe 150 to up to 500. So there's a huge spectrum, and um, it really depends on, on many factors. Similar thing with, with offices. We've done also benchmarks for hotels, and we see a wide range of variation. So benchmarking on its own is helpful, but without the right data or other information, it won't be won't be as helpful. So as you, uh, we cannot, let's say, compare Atlantis to, let's say, Ibis, for example, because of the totally different um, beast, basically. Um, so there's another point of sustainability is that who is driving the bus? And there's actually a, an upcoming talk from a uh, distinguished lecturer from Ashley coming to Dubai on the 30th, if anyone is interested, uh, 30th of May in Manipal University. So the title of, the, of that is Who's Driving the Bus of Sustainability? Is it IEQ or um, energy? Uh, but currently, it's the money that's driving that bus. So or any decision that is being made is based on a commercial uh, basis. Few companies, I would say, they'll look beyond those five years otherwise. So I think there has to be a um, that, you know, either reward, so let's say for AEDC, for example, I think Ahmad maybe mentioned that, they're doing rebates at the moment for air conditioners. So you buy an air conditioner, they would pay you back. So there has to be a combination of, of these two in order to push the existing buildings. And existing buildings are more difficult to, to tackle. I was just giving now the CMVP course at the British University, and we had a lot of people from Dubai airports. In order to really apply energy efficiency measures uh, on, on a buildings like airports, for example, there has to be a lot of proper studies first. It takes a long time to properly study the building and apply the right measures, and then um, you know, it has to be measured and verified. And this is something lacking. I think most of the consultants, they build their buildings and never visit them after that's done. So they don't understand how they're actually performing, what did the design come up to, and, and how is it performing. So measurement and verification, which is 
only currently used within the, the retrofit market whenever they're guaranteed savings, has to be used in other, other forms as well to be able to understand whatever we're proposing is actually working or not. So I'm sure you've designed a lot of buildings putting double heat recovery wheels. How much does it really save? Well, we put some numbers, do some energy modeling, but what is it, what's, it, what's happening on sites? And that experience is not being translated. And this is why, like, at Griffin, we, we try to bridge that gap. So we do a lot of existing buildings and try to apply that also on our designs and tell the client, look, this, yeah, on paper it works. Actually, these are the problems that you might face uh, on site. Um, yeah, very similar experience from my side. I recently, we recently carried out an energy survey for a 40-year-old building in Abu Dhabi, and the client did correct me on the ROI. He said it was an ORO SI. <laughs> so that was a nice little um, slant on it. But a 40-year-old building was outperforming the benchmark that we had by 10%. So it's not necessarily the older buildings that are less efficient. It's being controlled by a phenomenal facilities management team. Um, it's got a great BMS and it's the behavior of the tenants in the building reflects the energy requirements of the building and no more. So and, and also, let me add, the indoor environmental quality aspect is sometimes missed, where a lot of buildings turn off their fresh air handling units. So they may be doing well in terms of energy, but if you don't dig deeper and understand why is it performing better, it might be due to poor quality within the building. So that, this has to be taken into account as well. Absolutely, thank you. And Dr. Ali, um, as Aegis, you guys are working on a huge amount of master plans, especially in Saudi Arabia right now. How do you apply these um, energy intensity units or kind of benchmarking across a big master plan? And how, we just talked about how willing are people to kind of share the information on benchmarks. What are Aegis doing with regards to kind of streamlining how buildings are performing across bigger developments? Um, what, what we have is a, we, we came up with an internal platform that uh, we're planning to launch the finding of that platform to create databases for all the buildings that, and projects that we contribute to their design because we believe as, as uh, all my colleagues mentioned um, our major contribution to climate change is the build projects that we design. We can reduce our business flights and all that, but the real impact is these millions of meters squared of built environment that, that we design every year. So we're trying to develop that database, and uh, because without that database, you're basically up in the air in terms of uh, what are you trying to achieve in terms of the percentage reduction against a given baseline. That's more the case um, for the embodied carbon, in my opinion, because in terms of operational carbon and efficiency of the systems, traditionally a lot of it, attention was given to it. I know that they still are struggling with sick buildings and inefficient buildings, but I think that the knowledge industry and the know-how is quite mature on that area. But embodied carbon is the topic that we are a bit um, nervous about because it's about the impact and uh, absolute carbon emission production now in this decade, which is the very decade that we are going through that big point of irreversible damage to the climate change. So we can, we can think about life cycle assessment of the energy systems of the building and try to push the boundary to be even more efficient, but the, the, the likes of um, um, Hassan uh, the, and the thinkers in that field, they've done such a great job traditionally on the operational side of things uh, across all the consultancies and in, in our industry. We are, we are quite comfortable that we, we've done what we could so far. There's always room for improvement on operational, but embodied carbon baselines are something that are missing and we are trying to, to kind of develop a very strong baselines around that. That said, that doesn't take the responsibility away from us to try to, without a concrete baseline and database, not to attempt to optimize our designs from embodied carbon and operational carbon point of view. We need to get out of our comfort zone. I mean, our structure engineers, I'm sure there are quite, I hope there are quite a few of you there. Um, we, we, can, we can carry on and design a core wall of a tower with a C50 concrete with a constant thickness all the way up because it's easier design, it's a unified design. Or we can spend a little bit of time to reduce the concrete 
strength going cert above certain levels, we can reduce the thickness of the wall, hence reduction on the cement content, hence reductions on carbon footprint. So we don't have to wait for the databases to come because it's a, it's a really hefty task and it could take ever. I know that, for example, BRE in UK, they try to develop a database of carbon for um, different typologies of building and, it, and they, they kept it as an open platform and it ended up uh, in a bit of a joke because you had some people reporting their office buildings at 12 kilograms CO2 per meter squared and the other person was saying the 10,000 kilograms CO2. So the system boundaries were vague. The, it wasn't clear that whether you or not you're comparing Apple with Apple. So establishing benchmarks and databases are important. Uh, it could take a long time, but I think whilst we're working on that and developing that, it's important that we share knowledge amongst each other. It's not something that we retain to ourselves. We should kind of put it in public domain and share our uh, lessons learned. But at the same time, I think we, we have the obligation, moral obligation, not just being uh, driven by the policy um, that to, to, to force us to go that way. Because, you know, 20 years ago when I was talking about sustainability, it was like, oh, another tree hugger, uh, you know, Everybody was annoyed from the developer and client all the way to the direct project directors. But nowadays, look at it. It's, it's on the top of the agenda. And whatever we do, there is a Greta that says, oh, it's just blah, blah. You need to do more than that. So I think we, we, we really have the moral obligation. The passion is required. The transformational change and the behavior is required. And we cannot wait for uh, policies. And I mean, it cannot be any more higher on the political agenda, climate change and sustainability, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting you mentioned the building structure. Maybe we can touch on supply chain a bit because that's a huge barrier that we're all hitting at the moment. Fundamentally, buildings in the Middle East are steel and concrete and they're the biggest contributors to our carbon footprint on our, um, on our uh, carbon emissions. <laughs> um, from a Jacob's perspective, you're obviously designing your carbon monitoring. Embodied carbon, what do you, how can the supply chain kind of move on to the next step. I know I find it very hard to get sub local suppliers to give me what I need with regards to transparency and data on their Correct. product. Potentially the product's not available. What are you finding and what do you think we can do to help and encourage the supply chain to align with what we need? So that's a very hard question to answer. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> You'd be a billionaire if you do this. <laughs> I've been there, done that. But to uh, be honest with you, like we've been using some uh, softwares which is, I think most of us here have been using one-click LCA, which has a very good database, and where we have many suppliers can upload their EPDs and tell you how good or bad they're doing. So that's a good way or a benchmark for us to know what's happening. And again, then following up with suppliers, trying to get all the information. So many times we get to an end, to the dead end, we couldn't get that information. But many clients nowadays and developers are more aware of the importance of embodied carbon and operational carbon. So yes, as we discussed earlier, there's two aspects of operation and embodied. Many people think it's one carbon or one net zero. So uh, thank you for you know, pointing that <laughs> item out. So I mean, given my commissioning background, I'm more into the operational carbon, reducing the energy during the, during the operation of the, of the building. Uh, we pointed out a very important item in the MMV. So clients being aware of how their buildings are operating is more and more important. I mean, uh, looking at uh, the numbers, that I think I read them last week that to, out of the 30, 89% that the buildings contribute for the GSG emissions, it's actually 28% in operation and 11 embodied. So that was an interesting number to know. So I was like, yeah, I'm doing a good job. I'm reducing the operation stage. So if I just ask the people here, so who actually keeps, let's say, track of how much he pays every month as a budget? Just by raise of hands, like, who puts a budget with them? Yeah, just check how much money they're saving. So it all comes down to the money. So everybody knows or wants to know how much you're spending. And I think this is one of the items in the operation stage we can reduce and help them sell the property to you know, the tenants. Uh, again, it's going to be a huge, it's not impact, but it's going to be more like a, a higher cost in the capex when investing into more sustainable building. But looking at many developers nowadays where they include, as you said, the FM under the same company. So they look at the full life cycle. So in the OPEX, it's reducing the operation cost. So they're still making a good benefit or a good profit. But coming back to your question on supply chain, we're still working on it. <laughs> and I think developers will potentially be the ones that really drive drive that. Um, and you, you did say that sustainability is number one on people's agenda. I don't think it is. It's still money. 
until, until we start talking in carbon instead of dollars, we will never change. And we're working with Aldar at the moment and they've got a carbon tax that they put in. Um, and that really is a differentiator because now every project is how much carbon is it using as opposed to, uh, they obviously talk about money, they're on a par now as opposed to be one after the other. And the second thing I would like to disagree with, because Jason told me he'd give me $50 if I started a fight today, <laughs> <laughs> um, is we're not doing enough. We wouldn't be here if we were doing enough, right? The world's on fire. I drove here in my car. I could have got a metro. True. Um, we walk the walk and we're trying our best, but there's definitely more we can do. Um, Omar, if you could give one takeaway on, to a building owner on what to change today on his or her building. To Dr. Jai Khan, what would you advise him? Me? Yes, yeah. please. Sorry, <coughs> Hassan. <laughs> Apologies. Does that go somewhere? Um, well, one advice? <laughs> one advice? One change that he could make to his building today to set him a little bit nearer to his net zero building Look, ambition. I, I, would, I, would, I would basically change the question to what the government would need to do. And the, the biggest driver towards energy efficiency, at least, is the tariff. So once the tariff is changed, and which is, we, not, we don't have a very low tariff in Dubai, but double the tariff and, you know, everything becomes, the ROI becomes half, then everything becomes viable. So I think, but it, it's a very tough decision to take and you need to take into account what, what is the effect on, 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 the, on the, uh, the whole economy. So, but normally tariffs are what drive. Like what's happening in Europe nowadays, you see the tariff went up, a lot of solar installations, a lot of uh, energy efficiency that happened. People I know in their own buildings, in their own houses, they're uh, you know, adding uh, solar and adding energy efficient equipment to combat that. But from a developer point of view, I mean, it will always stay the cost, just like you mentioned. The first thing they will ask you, how much does it cost? It's not, it's, it's not yet there where you have these carbon taxes or you have any incentives or you're paying penalties if you cross certain embodied carbon or uh, a, a operational carbon. What, what is required is integrated design. I, I still see architects working on their own, coming up with some crazy ideas, and then the structural engineer trying to build that, the MEP engineer trying to find what space they got fit the and fit their equipment, and it, it ends up not being the optimum location, not being the optimum size, and they cannot you know, use the most optimum uh, system. So I think the, uh, which I think you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Jagat know, know this, knows this, is that integrated design is, is what really, I mean, we all say we're doing it, but I don't think, I've seen a lot of projects that just on paper, but it's not actually done. So integrated design to me is very important um, in terms of reducing the loads. So once you tell the architect, okay, there's another way, maybe you should use this kind of window to -wall ratio, these windows in this place are not really beneficial, put them in that place and doing some uh, basic energy modeling and showing different options can help making decisions better. So I would say best, best thing is to make sure that the consultants are using integrated design approach. If can then jump in as well. So. You just mentioned very, very, very nice and good items about the energy model, how it's been used. Unfortunately, it's coming as a, at a cost for the consultant. So nowadays, let's say I decide to change the U-values. U well, how much does that help me or assess me? Or well, I need to do an energy model. Who's going to pay for your energy model? We only have one energy model to be done for the whole design stage. So we always get in that fight with the project managers like within the consultancy to actually do more. And, be and, and it's an afterthought. Like the energy model is coming at the end of the design to prove you got the Estidama you, you points. You got it 12%, yeah. But it never is not used as a tool to really optimize designs, or at least, I'd say not all projects, but most of the projects that I've seen, it's being used at the, as, as a compliance. So you do the energy model, okay, we got the points. Probably it's not accurate as well, like the energy model is not depicting the right design. I've seen multiple buildings where we were being, as a commissioning agent, reviewing the models, and they were actually not what was designed, but it got approved by lead and they got the, they got the points. And that's one thing also, so once we, I mean, I was lucky to work on a project from design, construction to operation, and that was one out of 50. So usually you do the design, you're out, you do the construction, you're out, so one out of 50. I was able to verify in uh, six months how much is their actual consumption and then go against the energy model, which was for me was a huge success. Like, like finally, I have one project that is actually working. So I do agree. It's a hard uh, 
So life cycle. Uh, Dr. Ali, again, just to touch on where you've got big scale projects and multiple buildings, where can we gain economy of scale across a large portfolio of projects with regards to net zero? Um, anything we can implement, anything you foresee that would be something that may not be necessarily applying to one building, but will help in a portfolio level net zero roadmap? Yeah, it's easier. At the, let's go back to our fight first. Um, <laughs> I, 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 you're correct. What I said, I hope I chose my words carefully, is that it's never been so high on the political okay. agenda. Uh, it's, not, it's not enough, but I mean, we have to use what we have, and I think we are much better placed than we were 20 years ago. Um, in terms of one more caveat on the cost, I think um, whilst I agree that uh, yeah, you sometimes you need to spend a bit more upfront to get an, a good ROI, but we need to break that cliche as well that sustainability costs you more money upfront. It's because, especially in the in the field of embodied carbon, um, when you reduce your embodied carbon, you're actually doing a value engineering, like you're saving uh, material consumption, you're optimizing your design both from structural or uh, carbon embodied in MEP equipment. So necessarily to move towards a net zero design doesn't mean that you're uh, adding cost to the, to the developers and impacting their ROIs. On the other hand, it could be, it could be actually saving on CapEx. Um, and I, I think nowadays we should be able to offer a very highly sustainable design to our client at a much lower percentage addition on the capex. I mean, again, 20 years ago, if I wanted to offer lead platinum to a developer or to a client, I would have said it's about 10% addition or 7 to 10% addition to your capex. But nowadays, lead platinum, I would suggest it's somewhere between 4 to 5% maximum in your capex. So that's, that's and that's is because the, the, the minimum requirements are getting more and more stringent. On the economy of scale, of course, when you're dealing with the portfolio of the master plan and then you have option of on-site renewables, that's something that we didn't tap into is the definition of net zero. I've done an exercise a couple of years ago in a conference that I grouped the teams and I asked them, what, do you, what is the definition of net zero? Because you could say that net zero, I just reduce my, you know, in a rich country, uh, reduce my carbon footprint by 10% and then 90% of it I just plant trees in Africa, and then I'm, I'm net zero, so, or, or neutral. So I think these definitions are, at the moment, I think they're being a bit abused, so they need to be carefully defined and be consistent across the clients and consultants, because then on the economy of scale, when I have a portfolio of buildings, if I have an island in Neom, or if I have a master plan with Expo, as we do have at the moment, then we can look at opportunities every corner of our master plan to maximize, to reduce our carbon footprint to the minimum possible, and then whatever is residual, both in terms of embodied and operational, then we try to offset it by means of on-site renewables, because a big macro-scale master plan can afford that, and then uh, whatever is left, then look into credible off-site renewable strategies for that. Uh, for that. So yeah, the, the bigger the projects, and the earlier in the projects we are involved, you have a better um, opportunity to achieve Thank That's you. Right. I'm just conscious of time, and Sorry. I have so many more questions, but I have to end on one, and it's for my son. Carrie, what superhero are you today? <laughs> what superhero am I today? <laughs> oh, la la. <laughs> no, thank you so much. I think we're going to open the floor up to questions for a few minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Fadi Bayout. Um, I, it's more of a comment rather than a question. Um, when you started the embarking on your panel, I was surfing on my LinkedIn profile, and I saw... Uh, BCG has just today um, issued f the 50 most innovative companies in 2023. And guess what? None of these 50 companies are APC or any way related to engineering construction. There is Shell, there is Aramco, but none of the APC. Now, why are these companies successful? Because I know as, as of a fact that these companies have, they look at the future in a different way than we in the APC look at the future. In this, in this today, we have two sessions that talk about the future, but do we really know what kind of future we need for our companies and for our built environment? Honestly, based on the discussion that we are having right now, or 
and other discussions, we rarely think about what future we envision, what future we want to have. I believe that we need to start with looking at the different futures that we have and start, start backcasting. By doing that, we will be able to collaboratively working together into finding the solutions that will allow us to go into the future we all envision to. And this future, of course, as Kelly said and Dr. Ali said, we are still lacking the very basic definition of net zero, let alone what kind of future we would want to have in our built environment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a comment back. I think we do know where we're going in the future. I think our commitment is by 2050 in the UAE, we have to be net zero. And by 2030, we have to reduce our energy consumption by 30%. We're, there's going to be lots of goals, lots of different goals and lots of changes on the way, but we need to focus on 2030 to begin with and do the best we can, I guess. And they will keep changing and different clients will change and I'll our take, approach will change. I'd like to jump in. Uh, future is something we know the target, but as of now, uh, it's also questionable whether we have full control of the future. So rather than asking, uh, do we know the future? Probably I could also uh, suggest uh, requesting uh, in the form uh, to ask, are we doing the best out of what we have currently? Mm. So uh, net zero, uh, carbon neutrality, absolute zero, these are the terms that, that are nice to use and uh, good to use, feel good. Uh, but it is not fair to uh, jump on that and forget our own position. So we are talking of uh, net zero uh, strategy. But to what extent is the built and we also keep uh, uh, discussing uh, built environment is responsible for over a third of emissions, probably 30 to 40 percent. Not everything is under control. If I bring it back to energy usage intensity, benchmarking, whatever, if it is 160 kilowatt hour per square meter per year, net zero is bringing it to zero, right? Are we in a position to bring it to zero? See, if Diva changes the grid to 100% green uh, in the next five years, we automatically become zero, irrespective of the inefficiencies that we have within our buildings. So, uh, so b basically, I would still focus on uh, not getting obsessed with uh, certifications, net zero, uh, uh, carbon neutrality, carbon trading, or carbon auto but rather focus enormously on our design side, uh, demand side management. As all the other panelists discussed, try to do the best of the design from day one, reduce the uh, energy demand of the building, and construct it in the best way so as to operate that, so as to get the operation sustainability. But again, we do not have any control on embodied carbon as of now. That's a scope three. Operational control and energy at source, that's the scope one and two on which we have control. So I think to begin with, in the short term, that's the only source of, uh, that's the only path for us to go towards focusing on that and trying to reduce it. And then allow the rest of the te technologies, probably carbon capture or uh, at the, as carbon trading as a lender of last resort to reach net zero. So as much pressure as we have on the buildings, the other sectors also have pressure, transportation, manufacturing, power sector, Shipping, aviation, they're all on the path to net zero, but none of them have the path as such. There's still a lot of uh, gray areas, although it is good to uh, talk of net zero, but as of now, we know there's a target, but we do not know uh, whether we are on track. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Dr. Ali? Very quick one. Uh, I agree. I think I need, we need to admit and agree that at least there is, at the macro level, net zero is defined, but it's the job of the likes of us, the consultants, and different industries to kind of translate those macro level ambitions into the tree down to the project level and to the details because there is exactly those details that that macro level aspiration can be achieved uh, as, as uh, um, a doctor mentioned for, for the scope one, two, and, and threes. Uh, the same happened with SDGs. I mean, I know that we're all talking highly of SDGs, but essentially it was a lot of uh, KPIs, but nobody knew what to do with them until the taxonomy landed and tried to convert them into material actions, and then it became something tangible, and then you can make an improvement. So I agree, there are at macro level that the net zero is mentioned, but uh, yeah, it's an ongoing work that we need to make sure that micro level be translated. And if, if I can just action. leap in here, I think that's a very good point. If I can just leap in here, Louise, that I think in response to your question, we're very good at, <clears throat> excuse me, we're very good at understanding where we're at in the present. 
we're not very good at choosing the future. Yeah. And I was fascinated by the comments of Carrie and Hassan, you know, 20 minutes ago, whereby Carrie, as you rightly said, there's no shortage of regulatory frameworks and legislation. There's actually a, an overwhelming abundance of it. But as you then rightly said, Hassan, how rarely are these factors ever built in from day one when a project is costed and conceptualized? And there you have it. There you have, between the two of you, that's the, that's the contrasting situation that we face. And until we resolve that, we can't choose what the future will be like. Yeah. One of my colleagues in London said to me a few years ago, it's all about good carbon and bad carbon. We're getting a lot of scrutiny about having COP here in a, in a few months' time because it's an oil, an oil rich region. But fundamentally, we need energy, right? The sources are not available that can replace oil right now. But if we work on the basis that I have to get in my car to go to work, it's necessary, or I can work to work, I can walk to work. So I'm using bad carbon because I can walk to work, or I'm using good carbon, or uh, sorry, or I'm using good carbon to be in my office because I have to have an air-conditioned office. And if we all kind of work on that preface of necessity of carbon and using it when it's necessary rather than a luxury, we'll definitely be in a better place. Questions? Yeah, any other questions? <laughs> yeah. Please. You, you were very quick to put your, please, uh, you first. Yeah. Yep. Oh, in fact, uh, I'm so sorry, we'll come back to you in one second. Please, over here. Sir. Good afternoon. Yep. I have three questions, quick ones. Uh, one, he usually two. asks very hard questions, by the way. Did I know, you prep him for these I, questions? I know him. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks, for the, thanks for the panel. Mohammed, the question for you, and question to Ali, question to, Dr., to Hassan and to Dr. Ali. I'll, I'll start with Hassan. Hassan, I would love to hear your thoughts on demand response. We're all talking net zero and shifting to renewable energy. At what point do you think we can solely rely on renewable energy while taking in consideration the supply-demand response? Because I find it challenging at a point to phase out completely the fossil fuel and rely completely on renewables, not having enough security of energy when the weather condition does not really uh, support you in generating whatever the energy you require for your demand. Uh, that's one. Dr. Ali, too, you, you brought up a good well, let's point. Let's answer one at a time or they'll forget. <laughs> Hassan. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, when it comes to demand side management or demand response, we have to look at the macro level. So uh, let's say a city of Dubai, for example, we have to start thinking of, we won't be able to have net zero buildings like the Sheikh Zayed Road uh, skyscrapers probably will never hit the net zero. Uh, but we need to, like a lot of warehouses where you have a lot of space, Anything at G plus one, G plus two, you definitely can get net zero with the current technology. We're designing now a building that <clears throat> did not cost a lot in terms of the additions. It was just the PVs that were added. So we need to look at the macro level. Um, we need to also look at the cooling parts. Cooling is the most, let's say, intensive energy uh, system. So all our district cooling plants are, and if you look at the programs from Dubai Supreme Council of Energy District Cooling is program number three, or efficient cooling is program number three. So now we need to look at thermal storage as well. So we do a lot of thermal storage currently at night when the um, uh, chillers are not required. We probably will need to shift that to storing cooling during the day when there's abundance of uh, photovoltaic uh, and, and energy from the sun. So now we will need to ch change the way we are, let's say, treating our thermal storage because as you know, in terms of thermal storage compared to electrical batteries, that's a much cheaper solution. So we need to look at on an also integrated uh, way of how do we channel that energy to end up with the most efficient, cost beneficial um, way. So we need to look at adding PVs wherever we can, looking at the thermal storage for, for, uh, for plants, connecting buildings. So you have a lot of buildings that have extra capacity, they're not being used. Why not connect them, connect those buildings together? So integrating everything, IoT, AI, will help us in solving the demand side um, and coping with the, with the production side. Yeah, I agree. Quick one. And I know there was a question just over there at the back. You have to get a token for the next <laughs> session. That's all right. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Hassan. Hello, hi, Ben. Uh, great uh, panel discussion. In fact, uh, my question is a very simple thing in terms of uh, net zero buildings in the present. That is, how important is baselining? For example, roughly we got around 15,000 plus multi-storied buildings. 
uh, in and around uh, Dubai. Let's say building number one, what is the carbon footprint it generates today? If that kind of a communication is there for, let's say, for number of buildings, people in and around the community is aware that what is the footprint it is generating today? So what is the panel's thoughts maybe on baselining or communicating? What is the footprint it creates today? That actually creates a, a step forward to, you know, moving towards a net zero achievement or a journey. Hmm. I mean, uh, my rule of thumb is that I started 500 kilograms CO2 per meter square of the building for embodied carbon. And, uh, but that's a comfortable target, so year on year that's getting, it get tighter and tighter. I think, uh, but, but that's the rule of thumb. But if you want to, then, then the, the reality is that you get to the different typologies of the buildings, the, the, for example, if it's uh, hospitality, if it's residential, if it's commercial, if it's mixed use, both in terms of embodied and energy use intensity. But I think, uh, I agree with you that the baseline is important, and that's what we are trying, to, as I said at the beginning of my talk, that uh, we're trying to build that database. Uh, but it's a very sensitive topic because you need to make sure that if you want to put a rule that, for example, a resi building, the superstructure should be 160 kilograms CO2 per meter square, just the superstructure's carbon footprint, then you need to consider that, okay, is that fair on a building that is in a seismic zone that they need a you know, thicker core wall or a thicker superstructure compared to somewhere else, and then if it's, you're looking at a, a building in a, in, a, in a climate that is aggressively hot climate, you need to use energy intensive cooling systems as opposed to if the same building was in Europe, then you know you can use all different means of heating and geothermals too. So I think there are a lot of factors and that's why it's not readily available, this information they just look at the building and say, this is its current carbon footprint. Um, you, you can measure based on, by, by measuring the, its energy use and as it is, but as a baseline, it's a study that has got a lot of caveats to it. But we can set some um, rule of thumbs, 500 kg CO2 for embodied carbon, what, 160 for EUI, I think something like that. That's my but, uh, sorry, would that kind of uh, initiative bring more buy-in from the residents, the community, because people are aware that this is a serious topic and what can we do as an individual, as a community, to bring in efforts to reduce this carbon footprint on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Because rather than bringing it top down, if it is actually bottom up of residents who are living in the building, people who are working in a commercial building, people working in a hospital, everybody owns up to that particular initiative. Just by communicating, this is our carbon footprint, what can we do forward? on our journey towards net zero. I think education is a huge part of that. Um, sustainability City is one of the most successful developments in the UAE. And as a community, they do report their emissions. They do have a community environment where they're all part of the biodiversity. They don't have cars outside their house, etc. So they've bought into that sustainable community. And then they're now seeping the rewards of that. And if we can kind of bring that educational piece to other communities and other individuals and buildings. I think it's a win-win for everyone. If I can just also add to that point, um, for establishing the baseline, we can also look at you know, the existing building codes and the database that is available you know, openly public. Um, just to, you know, maybe, for example, understanding what is the EU value that is required for, you know, building efficiency, what is the, um, the you know, HVAC uh, requirements, um, you know, ventilation rate, so forth and so forth. But uh, we can, you know, put that into the database. But I think it's also important, uh, as it became really apparent in this panel discussion, is that the, the use so the uh, availability of data is one thing. You know, of course, the client is, uh, you know, improving this point. Um, but also, what's more, what's in addition to that, what's important is how we can make use of this data. And in order for us to move from, you know, compliance to really performance, you know, um, behaviors, we actually need to make use of these, um, you know, data-driven you know, solutions. And, um, you know, we have those, you know, 
technologies that are available and you know uh, machine learning and AI that is uh, enabling us to do you know data analytics based on this database that we are building in, in this region. And so, Mayuko, so sorry to interrupt. I can just add to that point. Um, something that I'm aware of that you will be even more aware of is that we are seeing now the great civil engineering firms and the great architectural firms, companies like Skidmore, Owings, Merrill, for example, create patented structural net zero solutions with new types of building compound that actually breathe in carbon monoxide and give out from the surface oxygen. So I'm thinking, say, Skidmore, Owings, Merrill's urban sequoia concept. Now, in many cases, those packaged brands aren't quite ready yet to be rolled out wholesale, but they're very much thinking along data-driven lines to create those packages, as you've just said. Yeah, uh, it's a really great point. And I think it's also important for us to you know, realize that this we require a whole system approach in achieving net zero. And as you rightly mentioned, we actually need to package up you know, the asset uh, life cycle solutions from you know, all the way from planning stage to design stage to operations. And in the Middle East, we have this you know, kind of opportunity as our cities and you know, communities are being built as a green field. So we have opportunity to really invest um, our, our effort into getting it right from the day one. Um, and, and really incorporating the aspects of not only the buildings, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, but when we design the mixed-use communities, we also need to, you know, look at the transportation systems and the, um, you know, dry and wet utilities, uh, waste management, uh, landscaping to offset. And all of these solutions actually needs to come together as a whole system approach. Absolutely. And Can we I have just time add, for, uh, sorry, uh, two points on the... Yes. This is a very good question. So there's a, the, let's say the developer part, the tenant part, and you as an individual. So let's say in Jacobs now, we're walking the talk and we are, have our set for net zero as for SPTI. So one thing we're doing, for example, is you're only allowing, not allowing, but asking only 25% of the employees to come in. And then the rest are working from home, which is reducing your transportation towards the, to the office, also reducing the office space used for your employees. And then we even have these, I would say, Maybe every three to six months, we get this email saying, it's a questionnaire, just verifying how do we trans get our transportation to the company. So they'll ask about your car, how far you live, and if they have an incentive for you, for example, to change your uh, modes of transportation, would you consider that? So that's the, the part they're doing. On our side, so for example, how many times, or anyone here, have checked their utility bill, not just to pay, but just to understand how much kilowatt you're using compared to your neighbors? I mean, uh, until I got into commissioning, I understood how things work. That's when I started like, looking at these utility you bills. You build benchmarks here. Correct. Yeah. And then, see, OK, we're doing bad this month. So uh, why, if you have to switch off the, the air condition once you leave the house, let's go up to 25. So once, unfortunately, we get to pay and see the effect in money, that's where we can f actually feel it. Like last summer, when the petrol uh, prices went up, we all were considering, let's stop driving. Let's just take uh, metro. Let's look at electric vehicles. So I think education, as you said, is the main item, but until we're as conscious about money as sustainability, I think that's where we can actually become more for the future, as you just asked, <laughs> just getting all these questions together. So yeah, my um, two cents on the topic. Have, thank you ever so much. Yeah. Uh, time for one more question from yourself, sir. And then we wrap the session up, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a comment more than a question, actually related to the very interesting, definitely this is a very interesting panel. And, uh, Ahmed and, Ajar, uh, and uh, it's related to the uh, argument that we were just having with regards to the dream versus the future of energy and uh, the question of the carrot and the stick. Well, first of all, I don't want to sound as an advocate for the government side, but um, uh, we all know that uh, the road towards net zero and the words toward, uh, towards sustainability, uh, it's a long way. And uh, there is a roadmap and there are milestones. So instead of uh, evaluating where we are in terms of where we should be uh, 20 or 30 years from now, we should look at the steps as highlighted by the guests uh, and what we have achieved so far. 
Now, with regards to the um, uh, questions or the points and the viewpoints related to the government uh, or the, the stick and uh, points highlighted related to regulations, you know, more regulations, more mandates, more policies, I wish to highlight to everyone here that every policy or regulation or more stringent requirements uh, enforced on uh, whether green, field, green developments or brown developments, it has consequences, you know. Every new mandate will have a reaction and that reaction is going to cause another reaction. So <laughs> definitely the economy and the market is going to get impacted, you know. Uh, so the government studies that uh, the most important thing is that, uh, especially that we might have uh, international guests here, uh, uh, something we have highlighted in the previous session about the future of energy related to understanding the context, the culture within this region. Um, if we look into uh, UAE, uh, the energy and water are almost uh, heavily subsidized. Okay, this is something that we might not find, you know, in other regions. So we cannot simply, you know, like copy one successful experiment and uh, put it somewhere there. But there are cases where there are win-to-win -win situations and scenarios like Hassan has highlighted, you know, offering rebate programs by the government, financed by the government, where consumers would be encouraged, uh, will be promoted, you know, to adopt uh, high efficiency uh, tools and equipment apparatus, you know, towards achieving net zero. And at the same time, that would help the government reduce the subsidy on the energy and, ut and utility sector in general. So it's very important to understand the context, where we are, the roadmap, the milestones, and all of that. Uh, the stick might not always work, you know. I think the government is working really hard on studying not only what needs to be mandated, but what, uh, how that is going to impact the market. Because in the end, we all share the same goal. We want to. But like foster Carrie said, is it carrot or stick, stick, right? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I just wanted to add to what you're saying here to tie in with um, what Dr. Ali said, which was the moral obligation. So that comes in into a huge. I think, a huge factor into all of this. At the end of the day, if the institutions, if all the stakeholders are not invested, forget the money, forget the cost, are actually not invested into making this happen, it will not happen. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, and again, not to act, advocate for the government either, but actually to show how good it is, there was um, a pledge. It was, I think, called the... Um, um, net zero um, companies challenge pledge that happened earlier, I think late last summer actually. And there were 21 companies, including the likes of Aldar and Lafarge Cement, that signed up to this to voluntarily give uh, plans on how they plan internally. And that ties in with one of the comments that the gentleman behind you mentioned about the future. How do they intend to implement their goals? And science-based, it has to be science-based. How, how are they going to measure it? How are they going to do this? And how are they going to help the government and achieve that net zero goal? And this is not a mandatory. This was more or less they felt that they had a moral obligation to do this. And I think that's really important. At the end of the day, the future is not for us. It's for the future generations. So whether or not we're able to, to be there for them. Louise, one, one point on I think we're out of time. <coughs> just one point yes, on the future. Can I, can I just say, so sorry to interrupt, this has been a fantastic discussion. I was just saying to my colleague Jason, we, in an ideal world, we'd like to continue with this all afternoon. But, you know, this has been very provocative, very thought-provoking. Please, a huge round of applause for this fantastic panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.